All right, in the absence of questions, we start out here. We have just the accordion type device right here. And easy enough to lift up. So I just put it on the table there and then try to lift it up. Why is, all of a sudden is it so difficult to lift up? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, let's use physics terms here. Well, Ultimately, it comes down to forces. Oh, sorry, Taylor. It did not have the airflow that it did whenever he was holding it up. One more time. It didn't have the air. It doesn't have the airflow now, like it did when you were holding it up. And what do you mean airflow? Like there's no air inside of it. All right. I'm having difficulty today. Sorry. All right. I apologize. One more time. Okay, so whenever he was holding it up, it had more air that was able to come in and out of it, and then now it doesn't. Why does that keep it stuck to the table? All right, let's talk in terms of forces here. What force is keeping it down? Weight is keeping it down, it's its own weight. When you say weight, I just want to be specific. Are you talking about the weight of the device? Yeah. Okay, but I was able to overcome that earlier. Bring in some of the stuff that Taylor mentioned also, that would be helpful. She was, you were almost there. Doesn't it, there's no strain, right? Like, it's just like tension, but. Uh, when I'm pulling up, there's definitely tension pulling up on it. Right. It has its own weight pulling down, but that was not an issue when I had, when I was holding it here. Mm -hmm. There's gotta be some other thing exerting a force on it that is causing it to keep from being able to be pulled up. Friction. Uh, the friction would be parallel to the surface, so that would be a force going in this direction. <clears throat> and I will say it's generally a force that we have been ignoring up until now. Other. <laughs> yes, it would fall into other, uh, but we can do better than that at this point. All right, let's, so I have my object here sitting on the table. We have its weight acting down, the weight of, let's just say, A for accordion. Weight acting up there. I have a table here. Is there a normal force? Normal force? No, yes. So we have normal force pulling, pushing up on it, pushing down on the table. And then, I guess for completeness, we have the normal force from the table between the table and the ground. I think there is a resistance of air. Say that again? The pressure of air uh, on it. Is it addition of air? Pressure of air. I, pressure. I, I pressure. The pressure of air. Pressure. 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 Oh, thank you. <laughs> I apologize. Um, except pressure of air is not a force. However, it definitely relates to it. What is the force from air acting on this? All right, well, sure, we'll start there. Okay. That was not my original intent, but that we have to ask that at some point. In which direction is the air pushing on it? 
ultimately. It's also pushing from the sides, but those are going to cancel out. But we do have this force from the air, so force, I'll just put air here. But that force from the air was also acting on it when I was just holding it here. So two questions. One, what's causing this force of air? And there's several ways to go on this one. Okay? And I'm looking for more than just air. Potentially, this relates to buoyancy also. All right, so what is air, anyway? Not expecting that kind of silence on what is air. Okay, there we go. Uh, state of matter? Yes, you know, at least in my experience. If you've lived in the South long enough, you might, uh, the humidity might start to think it's a liquid you're breathing in. All right, so what goes into a gas? What, what's the gas made of? Elements. All right. What are elements made of? I did not get this thing right today. Atoms. All right. So we have these atoms floating through air here. What are the atoms doing to this thing? If the claim is that the air is exerting a force on it, then how is the air exerting a force? Would be a normal force? Uh, you probably could lump it into that. So what exactly is, so we have these, these elements, these atoms floating through the air, or molecules more likely. Um, what are the molecules doing to this? Why would it be a normal force? Because they're like touching it. Yes, okay. Uh, a little bit more than just touching. Well, they're all floating around inside of it, right? They are inside of it too. Let's talk about the ones on the outside first and then we'll get to the inside and why I can't lift it. So, air is weighing down on it? All right, so that's one approach right there. Air is, so we have the weight of the air above it pushing down on it. That's sort of the, the buoyancy look at it of, I have an object in a fluid and there's the weight of the water above it and then, uh, I guess, force, based upon the pressure, based upon the weight of what's above it, and then similar to what's below it. But in this case, um, but when you get down to the element level, if you talk about atoms or molecules, what are they doing to it? I think touching this a little bit off. Are they breaking it down? No, I, I hope not. Could it be because um, on the outside it's pushing down and on the inside it's pushing off? That's true. When you say pushing down and pushing up, what are the atoms doing? Are they dispersing? Say again? Dispersing? Yeah. It's just... So what do you picture when I talk about atoms in the air? What are you picturing? Like bumping into each other. Okay. Little dots. All right. <laughs> So in the context of this, what are the atoms doing? Sticking to each other, I guess. Uh, sticking or is it packed tightly? It's not... not packed tightly. No. I guess it, 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 I wasn't thinking it had devolved into a read my mind exercise. <laughs> we got the elements there. It is touching, but it's really more than just touching. They are banging into it. These molecules are zipping around, you know, picture the tiny little particles. They're hitting this thing and bouncing off. <clears throat> Let's connect it to some other stuff we've done. I've got a wall right here, an air molecule comes along, hits it, and bounces off. 
there has to be a force being applied to the molecule in order for it to bounce. If there's a force, force pushed on the particle, making it bounce, then the particle must be pushing back. That's what's causing this force here. It's the particles that are banging into it and bouncing off. Now it is doing it from all sides. So now we get into inside versus outside. Why is it that it is incredibly difficult to lift up right now? Because we do have air on the inside and the outside, and they're both banging up against the walls. Or for trying to lift it, we'll just consider just the top. I have air hitting it from the bottom and air hitting it from below. I have air hitting it from the top, air hitting it from below. I can lift it easily. I put it down. It's now hard. Why is it difficult now? Oh, there's still there's air inside. You went too extreme. Therefore, or are you going a different tack? Taylor, were you about to speak? Yeah, um, all the molecules, like, if there's, they're not able to get out of it, like, they're all stuck on the inside of it. There's, oh. like, track, well, when you had it up, it was, like, open, the accordion, and when you put it down, all the air, like, either expelled or they got tightly packed, so there's, like, pressure in there? There is pressure in there, I will agree. Pressure caused by the molecules banging into it. It's not completely devoid of air inside. No. All right, so let's sort of expand on that just a little bit here. I don't know how much the camera's picking up, but. So as I pull up on this, how much air is on the inside? Same amount as when I was in the secretary table. All right, so if I've got, let's say I've got a small box and I've got a bunch of particles inside of it banging around. And then I take that number of particles and put it inside a bigger box. Same number of particles, bigger box. What do you know about the banging against the walls now? They have more room. Therefore? Yeah, it's gonna move more. And more air will go It's more likely that it'll hit the sides of the box. That's where I'm going, same number of particles. So if I take the same number of particles, I have, I have now, because the air can't get into it, I have, a certain, I have a set number of particles here. As I expand it, I have the same number of particles, but there is more room. They're less likely to hit the walls, so they're exerting less force, and therefore there's less pressure. Whereas outside, we got a, in, in essence, close to an infinite supply compared to what's inside here. Just that little bit of difference in air causes it to keep from, from uh, lifting up. Now, this is all summarized into what's known as the ideal gas law. It's actually broken up into also three of them, and I never remember which ones are which, so I always have to look it up. There's Boyle's law, Guy Lussac's law, and Charles' law. Uh, chemists get all on Twitter into knowing which one's which. Um, for me, ideal gas law covers it all. PV equals NRT. P is pressure. V is volume. T here is temperature. N is the, in essence, the amount of, or the number of particles. Technically, it's the number of moles of particles. Okay, who said chemistry before? That was the about half again. And R is just a constant. 
make the right work constant. <clears throat> So if we keep the number of particles inside the same, which we have, the temperature, we keep the temperature the same. I, there's no fire in there, there's no heat source, so I assume that the temperature of the particles inside is pretty much the same as the temperature of the particles outside. So all of this is constant in this situation here. If I increase volume, so I basically have two, I have two things here, I have pressure times volume is equal to a constant, so as the volume increases, what does the pressure have to do? Increases. Yeah. And that, in essence, demonstrated right there very nicely. Because the main bit of force from the air is downwards, any force from the sides is canceled out. The and so it's easy enough to slide off to the side. Friction is not significant here, so I can just slide that off to the side and get it off just by going sideways until I can get a new supply of air underneath. And then the, oh, oh here we go. Diving Tony. Now, I call this diving Tony because uh, years ago I had frosted flakes and there was a diving Tony inside. It was basically shaped like Tony. It does the exact same thing here, uh, except diving Tony usually sank to the bottom at some point and stayed there. The, the eyedropper works a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I am going to squeeze on this. Now, if you're doing this as a trick for uh, a child, uh, you can get away with it. I don't have the nice sleight of hand for it but you can sort of pretend you've got magical powers. So the question is, as I squeeze on it, why does the eyedropper fall? Now, I guess one of the questions is, I guess, Cheyenne, you're the farthest away. Can you see the eyedropper? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm assuming everyone else can, but, because everyone has the same kind of eyesight. Why does the eyedropper fall? <clears throat> okay, that's so pressure is exerted. And there's less air in the bottle. Where does the air go? I mean, there's less air in the bottle compared to an empty bottle, or as I squeeze it, there's less air in the bottle. Or did I just miss here? Well, I guess it would be the same amount of air in the bottle, just... Yeah. All right, we'll eventually come back to that. That It's part of the solution. Uh, so pressure is exerted. Uh, so we need to talk about this at some point. And then there's this air has been brought up. What happens to it? And, oh, there it is, a smaller version of it. They normally do without white knuckling, it's more effective. All right, so this does the exact same thing, except it's just a portable model. Uh, so I guess, before we get back to the pressure, what happens to the air? Uh, since you brought it up, if you wish. You can squeeze it and tell us what happens to the air. Does it go inside of the mineral? Yeah. Right, there's already, that's where the air already is. So then the water would go into the medicine rubber, which makes it heavier, which makes it sink to the bottom. Okay, so we're almost got all the pieces there. That That is key. Where does the air go? Is it still bottom there? To the top, the water? Uh, yes, oh. yes. It's a little bit easier. The more uh, water you have in the bottle, the, the easier it is. Would it go to the top of the bottle? The air? 
If it did that, then when you let go, the amount of air in the eyedropper goes back to basically what it was before. So then the question would be, if the air goes to the top of the bottle, how does the air get back into the eyedropper? So I will say that the air doesn't actually leave the eyedropper. Um, with a caveat of, it is possible to squeeze it hard enough for the air to bubble out of the eyedropper. So does the air go into the, like, the black thing on top? Yes, okay. So what does that tell us about air? That it travels to an area of low pressure. Okay. <laughs> it can uh, go anywhere. Pardon? It can go anywhere. Except within the bottle. Um, so we've got so the air goes into the stopper. You said into the, the black part. I guess this. I guess the what is that part called? The squeezy part. The squeezy part. Okay. <laughs> so air goes in the squeezy part. Now we have pretty much the same amount of air we had before. And now it's in the squeezy part. I see a little bit in the glass tube. Um, what does it mean if I have air that can that's in this space and then it's in this space? I guess this is sort of a read my mind. I'll spoil it. Compressible is the key there. Gases compress. Liquids will compress also. Solids will compress, but not particularly well. I could not take Carolina red clay and shove it into a much smaller space than it already comes in. So gases compress. Now we have to get back to why does the gas compress? Uh, get smaller. Oh, I think there's a chicken and egg argument in that one. What what would cause it to take up less space? Well, is the volume decrease? Uh, okay. What would cause the volume to decrease? And please don't say it takes up less space. The pressure increase. All right. So let's get back to that. Where Cheyenne was. How does the pressure that I exert on the side cause the air to compress? I squeeze on the bottle here. I'm not touching the eyedropper at all. There's a, a property here of fluids that I'm trying to get towards. Uh, buoyancy will circle, circle back to. That'll get into something Taylor said earlier about water, water goes into the eyedropper, making it heavier and makes it fall, making it fall. Um, but how does my pushing on the sides cause the air inside the tube there, inside the eyedropper, to compress? I have Jedi towers. The force you're putting on the side is bigger than the force of sides. But it still is, how does it get from my hand to the eyedropper? I'll agree with what you said, but how does the force get there? Um, the water in the bottle pushes into the eyedropper from the force you cause. Yeah, that's probably close enough. <laughs> this is known as Pascal's principle. That pressure exerted on a closed container filled with the fluid.
is transmitted, so the pressure is transmitted throughout. So I push on the sides and that pressure that I am adding to it actually gets added everywhere inside there. So now I push on the sides, it, the, since gases are easily compressible, that pressure I exert on the sides is transmitted throughout the fluid and right there at that boundary, so we have the eyedropper here, I have a le certain level of water. This water is being kept at bay. The water is not going straight up through it because I have these molecules of air bouncing up, bouncing against the surface, keep it at bay. So this, the gas is exerting a pressure on the water. As I squeeze it, I now increase the amount of pressure at the bottom here. I increase the amount of force going up and it overpowers the gas molecules. Those gas molecules move into a smaller space. All of this is constant still. My volume of gas gets smaller, which means the pressure increases. And the pressure will increase until the pressure at the top of the surface matches the pressure that the total pressure coming in from below. The pressure caused by the water itself plus the pressure I'm adding. Right, questions to hear before we put the nail on the final, the final nail in the coffin. I should come up with a better expression than something that morning. Sorry about that. All right. So we do get more water in the stopper and it does indeed, um, does get heavy enough to fall, but let's talk in terms of buoyant force. So I basically have a stopper here with water. Remember that the buoyant force equals, so there's this force upward, the buoyant force, that equals the weight of the displaced fluid. Well, the displaced fluid, what's displacing it? Because I have fluid inside here. Uh, I, I guess in this case right here, the fluid specifically the water. The stopper itself is taking up space, pushing water aside. The glass in the sides is taking up space, pushing water aside. And then I have gas in here, which is also pushing water aside. However much water that is, that has gotten pushed aside, the weight of that water that's gotten pushed aside is the buoyant force holding it up. As I force more water into the tube, so I now have more water in the tube here. What's happened to the displaced water? Did it go up or down? So it pushed more water aside? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Are we talking about the stopper or the bottle? Uh, Are we talking about what happens when you put pressure on the bottle? All right, so when I push pressure on the bottle, I, more water goes into the tube here. Okay. What it's going for is that the water that gets, that is pushed aside, the water that's displaced that causes the buoyant force is the water that has to get pushed out of the way in order to accommodate the glass in the dropper, the stopper, and the gas itself. 
So as I squeeze on it, does the glass, glass change its volume? Does the glass get bigger or smaller if I push on the sides? No. Okay. Not any, not, nothing I can notice. What about the rubber itself? Does the rubber change its volume when I squeeze? Not significantly. Does the gas change its volume when I squeeze? No. Try squeezing that again. Looking inside the stopper there, does the gas change its volume? But doesn't it just move? It, it does. Does it take up less space? Yes. Okay. But it does change its volume. All right, so does the volume of the gas get smaller or larger? Smaller. Smaller. Smaller, okay. So the amount of water that has to get pushed aside to make to account for the glass, the, the squeezy thing, and the gas, there's not as much water as needed to it gets pushed aside, which means the weight of the displaced fluid drops, which means the buoyant force drops, which causes which allows it to sink. From a density point of view, as more water gets filled into this, if we think of the stopper as the squeezy thing, the glass, the gas, and the whatever water is inside it. As more water gets shoved up inside of it, one, we had space where the gas was now being replaced by a liquid. And so we increased density there. The gas takes up less space, so that density has increased. And so from a density point of view, we're increasing the density of the stopper and denser things will fall. Sink, probably is a better word. <coughs> Questions to here? So, given everything we have here, the essence of hot air balloons. 